Today's stuff we're going to be learning is Bava Batra Daf Kuf Yudchet. Today's stuff is sponsored by Tina and Shalom Lam in honor of their new grandson. Takarat Tatov Tashem for the blessing of new grandson Ayal Nachum, born on Yom Kippur and entered into the breed of Abraham Avinu on Shabbat Cholamoid Sukkot. Mazal Tov to our children, the proud parents, Sarah and Shmuel Lam of Modi'in. Today's stuff is sponsored by Debbie and Yassi Kvir in honor of their two sons, Elazar and Eliav, and their son in law Boaz, who are now serving in the army. They're serving Am Yisrael from the Lebanon border and beyond. May Hashem continue to protect all of Am Yisrael and Medina Yisrael. Amidenu l'shalom ufros alenu sukkat shlomecha ken yihi gatsam. Okay, we're going to get started with um, our continued questions of Rav Papa against Abaye. Amidenu l'shalom to everybody. So the first question we had was, and most of the questions, although not all, are going to be against the opinion that haaretz, um, right? That to the people coming into the land, that's how the land was divided. No, or Papa seems to think, because he keeps raising questions against the other opinion, doesn't sound right. It seems like it was really divided by the Yosem Mitzrayim. So let's just review these two approaches. Again, there were really three, but we're going to go with overall two approaches. Did everyone who got out of the land of Egypt, when they left the land of Egypt, and they were 20 years old, everyone who left got a portion, and then from then it went to their children? Or was it given to everyone, and then again, that would be divided equally between all the people who left Egypt? And that would explain what we just ended with, because theoretically you could have been a lot then, but now you're not so many, or you could have been few then, but now you're a lot. You're going to get based on what you were then, right? So if you were Rav then, you'll get a lot, even though right now you're not. Or if you were a few then, you'll get few, even though now you might be a lot. And that's that would explain that pursuit. But the approach that it was given to those, everyone who went into the land got an equal portion. Then there was a little bit of a tricky part because it had to be returned back to your family and then redivided among your family members based on how many were in the previous generation, but still, right, that would still be whoever had a large family would basically get a lot, and whoever had a smaller family would get fewer, so that pasuk becomes unnecessary. Second question, we're on the second line of Kuf Yuchet. If you say it was given to those getting out of Egypt, and by the way, I just want to point out, the question we had, the difficulty we raised and the first difficulty of our papas was not an answered in the end. There's no good answer. All the other questions there will be answers for. So our papa says to Abai, if you say Yotei Mitzrayim, then we understand Hainu Benot Then we understand the Benot Slavcha's complaint. And that was where we started. If you remember, we started with our Mishnah. If you say it was given to the Yotei Mitzrayim, well, then, Benot Slavcha get three portions, right? They get their, today we're going to see later, it's four, but according to the Mishnah, it was three. What three portions? Well, both their father and the grandfather was over 20 when they got out of Egypt. So their father got a portion and that they were making claims to. And their grandfather got a portion and they were making claims to two portions of their grandfather's portion because their father was the firstborn and therefore should have gotten the part from the double portion from the father. But that only makes sense if you say Leo Mitzrayim, and we understand what their complaint was. But Lamanda Amar Delishko. What are they complaining about if it's Lebaya Aretz? Now, what does that mean? Well, if it was given to the Ba'a Aretz, the daughters don't get anything because they're not men, right? The land was given to men who were going into the land. They weren't going into the land as men, so they shouldn't have gotten any portion. And therefore, right, it doesn't go back to their father. It goes, gets divided among everyone, all the men who are going into the land, and that's not them. So on what basis can they go claim our father if the land wasn't divided by the father? It was the land was divided by those going into the land right now. So it doesn't make any sense, to which they answer, Oh, no, no, no. What does it mean? Remember, if you said it was divided by those going into the land, what happens? So let's say Hefer has some brothers, which he does. His brother's kids, who are male, go get land because they each get a portion. But then it goes back to Hefer, to the father, and gets divided equally among all the brothers. And then Slochad, who's no longer alive, but still was a brother, 
basically the daughters should get the portion of their father. Now, again, let's just review. So, Benot Slavchad aren't in line with all the Ba'ei Haaretz, all the people going into the land to get parts, but they're cousins, they're male cousins, first cousins from the father, right? All of Slavchad's brother's kids get land. Now, when they each get a portion, let's say there's 10 of them, so they get 10 portions. The 10 portions go back up to the grandfather and gets equally divided among his children, right? Because it goes back to the Yotzei Mitzrayim, gets equally divided among his children. So those 10 portions get equally divided between all the brothers. Each brother gets a percentage of that. And then the Benot Slavchad say, well, our father's not here anymore, right? And our father, by the way, should have gotten double portion of that. And we should get that portion. So that's how Abai explains what it was referring to. So they get Hefer's portion of the Chazarav when it goes right back up to the Yotzei Mitzrayim, which was how we explained it in the first place. Okay, third question of Rav Papa. Okay, now we're going to talk about a different part. We're going to do... From this question and the sixth, the fifth question is going to be based on Psukim from chapter 17 of Yoshua. First, the end Psukim, then later we'll go back to the beginning Psukim. But the end Psukim in that chapter talk about the Bnei Yosef, the sons of Yosef, come to Yoshua and say, Maduan, okay, I'm in Pasuk Yudalid in chapter 17. Why do we only get one portion? We're a big nation. We've been very blessed by God. We have a lot of people. We need to get a big portion. So they came saying that to Yoshua. So now again, if we say it was given to those getting out of Egypt, this makes perfect sense. Because what are they saying? We have a lot of people. We didn't then. Okay, so we got out of Egypt. We were small, but now we're a huge nation. We're a huge uh, tribe. And we don't have enough land. But if you say it was for those coming into the land, what are they complaining about? They should have gotten exactly proportional to how many people they had. So if they had a lot of people, they would have gotten a lot of land. So there should be no complaint here. To which they answer no. What did they mean? We have a lot of people. We have a lot of children under 20. And remember, the land was only divided by the people who were over 20 at the time they got into the land. So you could explain that when they got into the land, they didn't get this no enough portions because they had gigantic families and their kids were all under 20. Didn't get They didn't get portions for them. And they said, well, you know, in another few years when they want to live on their own, we, have, we don't have enough space for all of them or we don't have enough space for them all to live right now because, right, because we're, we got a small amount of land. So basically that explains the the claim of them of the Bnei Yosef even according to the other opinion. Now I did mention that we're in the middle of these six questions that Rav Papa asked Abai. So we went through the first three again. La Rav Tarbev la Maatam Eid. The the Benot Slavchad should have no claim, and the Bnei Yosef should have no claim if you say it was given to the people going into the land. So those were his three questions against the idea that it was given to those going into the land. However. The first one we really didn't have an answer to, the other two we resolved. Now we're going to zoom out for a minute. And Abai is going to say, or I don't know, zoom out, but go on a tangent. Abai is going to say, if we take these, the last two we just discussed, we have the complaint of the daughters of Tzlachan and the complaint of the people of, of the tribe of Yosef. And what Abai is going to point out is those are the only two times, the only two complaints you see of people having issues with the, the land. Okay. So Amr Abai Shmami now, from here, from the fact that there were only two complaints about land and the and the uh, getting part in Eretz Israel, Shmami now lo hava elachad de lo shakya. Sorry, lo hava chad de lo shakya. From here, you can see there was no person among the Jewish people who didn't get a portion. Okay, now the Esau Kadata hava chad de lo shakya. If someone didn't get a portion, in a minute we'll talk about how possibly someone couldn't have gotten a portion. Someone had gotten a portion, they would have complained. And the assumption is that they would have complained, it would have been written in the Torah because we already have the complaint of Benot Salchad and we already have the complaint of the Bnei Yosef. And we don't have any other complaints, so it must be everybody got land. 
But theoretically, whether you say, um, whether you say that the the land was divided to the inhabitants of you know, those who left Egypt or the land was divided by the people who went into the land, either which way, and the Rashbam goes through all the options, either which way you could have theoretically had people who didn't get land at all, okay? So if we look in the Rashbam, it's a long Rashbam, but Shmamina, um, and you go to the second line there, Aliba demanda amar Mitzrayim, if you say it was given to those getting out of Egypt, how could you have had a situation that someone wouldn't have gotten land? below av. If you came out and you were less than 20 and you were an orphan, you didn't have a father. So you wouldn't have gotten your father's portion because he didn't get out of Israel, and you wouldn't have had your own portion because you I'm sorry, he didn't get out of Egypt, and you wouldn't have had your portion because you didn't get out of Egypt. So there could have been a case where an orphan left Egypt and, and was too young to get a portion. And then their children would have gotten nothing. So there could have been a case like that. Okay. Um, but basically we're going to say that didn't happen. Almost like it was a miracle. Like that, that kind of situation never happened. The Rashbam even says, I'm not going to be the Rashbam inside, but it could have been that even if that did happen, there was an orphan whose father, right? So didn't have a father and was too young getting out of Egypt and his kids theoretically wouldn't have got a portion, but either it never, it didn't happen. There was no such situation. Or it could be that they inherited from a brother who had no children. In other words, it could have been there was some relative that, let's say, he had a brother who was over 20, and then he could have gotten and inherited from them or could have inherited from an uncle who had no, no heirs. So that's according to that opinion. And then skipping down, if you say, what could have been the case? So there could have been Yitomim um, benesrim. Right, so it, there could have been again orphans who were under twenty, but again it would all go back. Why did why did there not why was there no situation like that? Because according to that, it goes back to the previous generation, and then at least right they would have gotten an inheritance from the the grandfather's family. So there's there was always some way, and therefore everyone basically there there was no situation where somebody didn't get a portion. So that's what Abai is basically assuming. To which the Gemara says, what kind of assumption is that? Just because people complain doesn't mean the Torah or, or say for Yoshua is going to record it. Hey, we don't record every single complaint that come up, even though, you know, if you look in Sefer Bamidbar, there's lots and lots of complaints, but they're not going to necessarily record every complaint. And therefore they say the following. Let's come up with a rule that would basically explain why those people who, why they're right, even if they're, you know, there could have been people who complained but they weren't mentioned in the Torah. Why is that? And there could have been people who didn't get a portion because they, right, they basically fell between the cracks based on the ages and they still didn't complain. Okay, why is that? The chitema, or sorry, they complained, but they weren't mentioned in the Torah. Why is that? The chitema did sabach v'ahane kat ve'kra, did sabach v'ahane lo kat ve'kra, if you want to say maybe those who complained and were answered and got what they wanted, like the Benot Tzlachad, the Torah bothered to write. But did Tzavach Veloahane Lokat Vekra? But those who cried out and weren't answered, maybe were written down. In other words, if you didn't get what you complained about, well, then there's no point to write you down in the Torah or in the in the prophets. So it could be that there were people who weren't deserving of land. They did complain because, of course, they're going to complain. But their answer was, sorry, tough luck, but, you know, you fall between the cracks and I can't help you. You don't fit into the rules and the guidelines. And therefore, they just weren't mentioned. However, But look at the B'nai Yosef. They complained. They wanted more land. And they didn't get more land. And yet they were mentioned in the Torah. So that option of saying maybe there were people who didn't get land and they just didn't bother mentioning their complaint because they didn't get what they asked for doesn't resolve anything because B'nai Yosef asked for more land and they didn't get more land. Okay, what, they're ending, what they end up getting told, and it's a bit of a, a hard section to understand, Yoshua tells them, go into the forest, okay? And then they say, you know, we don't want to go into the forest and that's not what we're looking for. And they basically don't really get what they want. Okay, now what's this thing about the forest? So we're going to understand this in another minute. And the Gemara is going to darshan this whole section, which is really hard to understand. 
So what the Gemara is going to say is, no, it could be, you're right, B'nai Yosef didn't really get what they want. They didn't get more area to live, right? What they were basically told is go into the forest and you can live in the forest, okay? Which, you know, wasn't really, they were looking for land that wasn't forest land and they're basically told go to the forest. And they, they weren't really happy, you know, it wasn't a satisfying answer. But what the Gemara is going to say is, even though they weren't answered and they didn't get what they wanted, that section was put in for a particular reason. It wanted to teach us, wanted to give us good advice. In other words, it was a lesson to be learned from that section. And that's why he was put in, which goes back to what Abayah said. It goes against what Abayah said. Abayah said, from the fact that we have the Benot Tzachar and we have the, the Bnei Yosef complaining and nobody else, proves that everybody got a halal. It was almost miraculous that nobody ended up in those categories that wouldn't have gotten land. To which the Gemara says, maybe they were. And they just complained, but they weren't answered, so they weren't mentioned. To which the Gemara said, no, also B'nai Yosef complained and weren't answered and were mentioned, and therefore that's not a good answer. But now they say no. Really, it could be. There were a lot of complaints. There were people who didn't get what they wanted, but since their complaints were unanswered, they weren't mentioned. B'nai Yosef, you want to say didn't get what they wanted? They were mentioned for a different reason, because we want to teach a lesson. What's the lesson we wanted to learn? The bilingual initially is the who me ain't a bisha. People have to worry about an ayin hara. Okay, meaning, what's an ayin hara really? If people use ayin hara for all sorts of things. What it really means is you don't want to, if you brag or show off or anything like that, it attracts attention. People then see, oh, wow, you're either wealthy or you're beautiful or you're whatever it might be. You have something that other people don't have. It causes them to be jealous. And the jealousy brings what we call the ayin hara, which people are superstitious about. But what it really means is, you know, people are going to look at you, be jealous of you, and, and that's going to bring your downfall, basically. So um, what this was trying to teach you is you have to worry about ayin hara. Now, where do you see that in the story? Well... Remember, Yoshua tells them, go to the forest. Now, what happened? They said, we have a huge nation, a huge tribe, because we were blessed by God. Okay, they're kind of bragging and saying, we have everything we want, except we just don't have enough land for it. But we have a, a you know, blessed family, and, and we need more space. So what is Yoshua? Now they explain, why was Yoshua saying, go to the forest? What was he trying to say? If you're such a great nation, you know, or a tribe, go to the forest. Which means what? He said to them, What's true about a forest? It's got a lot of places to hide, right? You think about all the people in the, in the Holocaust, right? Who hid in the forest. It's a great place to hide. Go hide yourself in the forest. The people won't see how blessed you are. And then the ayin hara won't get you there. Because again, what's ayin hara? People will see you and say all these things about you. So, and that brings money, ayin hara. So go to the forest and hide yourselves. Now they basically answered, we don't want to go to the forest. So turning now to Amabet, Amrule, now why did they say we don't want to go to the forest? Well, they said, Right, it's pretty good advice. Now, remember, this already answered our issue, which is the story was to tell us not about a complaint that was answered or wasn't answered, you know, and it's not, even though their prayer wasn't, their complaint wasn't answered, doesn't mean there were others who, right, could be for others whose prayer wasn't answered and they just weren't mentioned. This is mentioned not because their, their, their complaint wasn't answered. This was mentioned because they wanted to teach us this point that Yoshua was making, which is try your best to avoid Ayin hara. If you're blessed with something, be humble about it. Don't brag about it. Don't show it off to everybody. Okay? And that was the message. However, the B'nai Yosef said to Yoshua, you might remember we've seen this a bunch of times, not in this context, but in general, We don't have to worry about Ayin hara because Ayin hara does not get to the sons of Yosef. Okay? How you explain this in any real kind of way, I don't know. In other words, if there's such a thing as Ayin hara, Right then, which again, in in a, it's not just a superstitious thing. It's it makes sense. It's basically saying don't brag because bragging makes people look at you differently, right? And and almost want to bring upon your downfall because you make yourself look so great, it makes other people jealous, and then they might do things that cause you to lose what you have because they're jealous. 
you could sort of see it in a way like that. If you see it in a, you know, and then it's a little hard to understand, well, why doesn't that affect the Zerah of Yosef? But we're going to see why, where they get from the Psukim. It doesn't affect the children of Yosef. But if you see it on a more superstitious, then you can say, okay, well, the superstitions don't get to Yosef. Yosef is protected from superstition. Anyway, it's a good question. Um, also, Yosef, by the way, was someone who ended up with greatness. And in the end, I mean, he did have a rough path getting there. But in the end, he wasn't really brought down. Um, he remains, you know, the in, he remained in his in his position. Anyway, you can think about that. But now, why is where do we get it that Yosef doesn't have Ayin Hara and his children won't have Ayin Hara affect them? So there's two possible options, Dichtiv, and they're both from the end of Sefer Breshit, from the brachot that Yaakov gives. One is from the brachot Yaakov gives to Yosef directly, and one is what he gives to Yaakov's sons. So, right, first is the, they're going to start with the one given to Yosef in chapter 49, and we're going to go back to chapter 48 in Breshit to the one given to the, the grandsons. Dichtiv. Ben Porat Yosef, Ben Porat Ale Ayin. That's what Yaakov says to Yosef. So, what's this Ben Porat Ale Ayin? What's this Ale Ayin? I'm a Rabbi Abao. I'll declare Ale Ayin, Ella Ole Ayin. Don't say Ale Ayin, they go up to the eye, but Ole, they go over the eye, meaning the, they can get over the Ayin Hara. Rabbi, they're kind of above it. Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Hanina, Marmehacha, he gives a different pasuk, this is the bracha given to the grandchildren, you're going to be, right, we know this very famous pasuk, and Yidgula Rav Bekerva Aretz, you're going to be like fish, you'll be plentiful like fish um, in the land. What, why, like fish? Well, madigim shabayam, mayim mechasim alehem, ve'en ayin sholeta bahem, the fish are underwater and people can't see them properly. So people can't really see the Zerah of Yosef. They're like fish covered and they can't be seen, meaning the Ayin Ara can't get to them. So there you have two psukim explaining that. Again, that was all just to explain why the section of the Bnei Yosef is there. And it's there to say, if you're not from Zerah of Yosef, in other words, in the end, Zerah of Yosef, it wasn't relevant for them, but it does teach good advice for people to avoid the Ayin Ara by not showing off about things that you have that you're that are plentiful that you're blessed about you should be more humble about it okay and that explains why their complaint was mentioned and the Benot Slavcha was mentioned because they got what they asked for but there could have been lots of other people who complained who didn't get land and they were answered well sorry but you know you're not deserving of land because you didn't fit the criteria and because they didn't get answered in a way that they wanted there was no point to mention them in the Torah or in Yehoshua or anywhere else. Okay, now we're going to do a lead up to the fourth question because we're still, we got distracted from the questions that Rav Papa was asking about. It. Now we're going to do a lead up. So the lead up is, this is based on what we saw yesterday and we're now going to go into some of the things that I mentioned yesterday, but we didn't see them all inside. Miraglim Yehoshua B'Kalev Nadlu Chalkan. The spies, what happened? Well, they had a portion, but Yehoshua and Kalev got their portions. And then we said the complainers who we said, probably are the complainers, I'm going to see that inside today, how they get there, are the complainers from Korach, meaning the 250 people that went along with Korach, and Adat Korach and Korach himself and his family, which we had that question that we put aside that I didn't really find an answer for yet about if they're in Shevet Levi, Korach's family, they shouldn't have gotten a portion anyways, part of Shevet Levi, to deal with that still. I promised an answer, I'll try to get it, um, if I can. And... They didn't, now, what it said there, and I want to be more careful about how I explained this yesterday, um, it said there that they didn't have a chilek. Now, if they didn't have a chilek, what does it mean? Well, if theoretically they should have had a chilek, they didn't, it just means every other Jew got a bigger portion. Okay? But there was no chilek for them at all. It's not like they got, it was given to Kalev and Yoshua, they just didn't get a chilek, which again means, right, instead of it going to a particular person, Everybody just got a bit more because it was a bigger path to divide. So, Menon and Mile, how do we get this that Yoshua and Kalev got the part of um, the Meraglim? Amar Ula, da Amar Kra. So, Ula says, the Pasuk said, Yoshua bin Nun be Kalev bin Yifune, Hayu min ha'anashimahim. So, it says that Yoshua bin Nun and Kalev bin Yifune lived from the people, right, of the, of all the, right, they were still alive at the end of the time of the desert, okay? But it means, right, but what really they're, they're talking about is 
they survived and all the other Meraglim died. My Chayu, what does it mean? They lived. If it means they lived, well, Haktiv Krachrina. It says, now this is later in, in Bamibar, but it does say in chapter um, 26, when they're counting all the people, it says, right? It says no one from the generation of the people who got out of Egypt who were in the time of the spies survived other than Kalev and Yoshua. So obviously they lived, okay? So it's an unnecessary pasuk. What does it mean, chayu, they lived? It means they lived in their portion. It means they inherited their portion, okay? Like, it's funny because in Hebrew, you don't say that. Like, if you say, I'm living in this area, you would say, anigala, okay? You wouldn't say, anichaya. But in English, you actually say, right, I live here. It's the same word, to live and to live. So in English, that actually works better. So the drasha is that chayu means lived, and meaning they lived in their portion and they actually inherited their portion. So that's how we get the Yoshua and Kalev got the portion of the spies from that pasuk that says they survived and the other spies did not, which is a really unnecessary pasuk in light of Bamibar 26. So now they say, what do you mean? Doesn't it say in a bright time? Okay, so again, this goes back to what I said before. The, the, Kalev and Yoshua inherited the portion of the spies. But the Adak, Korach, and the Mitzlonidim, all that was just they never had, a, they didn't have a portion at all. And it was equally divided by everybody else. But they bring a bright now that says otherwise. Vahatanya, Miraglim, Mitzlonidim, Vadak, Korach, Yoshua, Vakalev, Natalu, Chalkam. It says the spies, the complainers, and the Adak, Korach, Yoshua, and Kalev inherited their portion. Sounds like they inherited. Everything, right? Um, they inherited their, Yeshua and Kalev inherited all of those people's portions. That's not what we just said in the bright tip that we we're quoting from that we saw in yesterday's talk. To which they answer, Lokashia. That's not difficult, meaning it's not a contradiction. It is a difficulty because there's, but we're going to say there's two different opinions. Mar makishmet lonenim lemeraglim. Mar lo makishmet lonenim lemeraglim. Okay, we're going to say, one opinion, one one of the one of these two opinions, one brighta says we're going to compare because they were juxtaposed in the verse, the mitzlonim to the miraglim, and whatever's true for the spies, we just explained Yoshua and Kalev inherited them, is also true for the the ones who complain, or and for Adak Korach. But Mar Loma Kish mitzlonim miraglim, and the other one doesn't learn a hekesh. We don't learn that what's true for one is true for the other just because they happen to be near each other in the pasuk. Where does this all come from? Where are they near each other in the Pasuk? And we quoted this yesterday, even though we hadn't seen it inside yet. Ditanya, as it says in a bright Avinu Right? This is when the Benot Slavchad come to complain and they say, listen, we didn't get land. And even though our father died and he sinned, which again, the, the Midrash says it was because he was the Mekoshe Shetzim. Okay, that they say he was the one who was chopping wood on, uh, on Shabbat but because they want to connect him to someone who we saw have sinned in the desert, but that's a drasha. But they basically say he wasn't part of all these people, meaning, right, the assumption being, if he had been part of those people, he wouldn't have gotten nachala. So let's see how we dash in the pasuk. So our father died in the Midbar, that's Slavchad, obviously. Buhu lo haya the pasuk continues. He wasn't part of the congregation. What congregation? Oh, the congregation that it talks about in in the Miraglim, which was, what does it say there? You can look at the Rosh Bani quotes all the important psukim. Zohadat Miraglim, this is the Miraglim, why? Dichtiv behu, says by the Miraglim, I'm in the Rosh Bam now, ad matay azot al malat. Right? So how, right, they keep complaining against these people, they ra'ah, they ra'ah, there is the spies, it's in chapter 14. So the word Eida that they mentioned, congregation, was also the word used about the congregation of the spies, and therefore we assume that's talking about the spies. The next words are Hanoadim al Hashem. Now it sounds like they were not part of the congregation that was going against God with Adah Korach, as if it's one thing. But they're going to split it up into three. They weren't in the Eida, is the Miraglim. They weren't Noadim al Hashem. These are the Mitzlonim. These are the people who were 
part, again, we're going to explain it later inside, but Rashbam already says, how are these mitzloninim in Noadim al Hashem? Because if the mitzloninim ba'adah korach, it says, l'chen atah v'chol adatcha ha-noadim al Hashem. God says to Korach, you and your people, right? Atah v'chol adatcha ha-noadim, sorry, Moshe says it, ha-noadim al Hashem, that are exactly the same words there are used, ha-noadim al Hashem, by Benot Slavchat. So that must be the people with Adat Korach. And Adat, so that's Elu Mitzlom Ninim, and Be'adat Korach Kimashmao, and Adat Korach is Korach and his family. So, Mar Makish Mitlom Ninim Lemaradlim, so based on that pasuk, we see these three things are right next to each other in the verse, because we have them all in one sentence. So, one says, therefore, we can learn from one to the other. So, since Yoshua and Khaled inherited the Maradlim, they also inherited Adat Korach and the Mitzlom Ninim. And Mar Loma Kish Mitlom Ninim Lemaradlim, and the other one says, we don't. Okay, that was all background to the fourth question of Rav Papa, which is coming right now. So we basically have two approaches. Do we say that the, the Mitlonanim and the Rav Korach didn't have land at all? Or do we say they had a portion and it went to Halib and, and Yoshua? So Amr, Papa Labai, Lomanda Makish Mitlonanim Lamaradlin, the one who says the Mitlonanim were just like the Maradlin. Now he doesn't understand it the way we did. He thinks the Midlonanim are people who complained in the desert. Now, how many people complained in the desert? Okay, we don't have the numbers, but we know that it was most of the nation was complaining, right? We had the people complaining about the meat. We had all sorts of complaints. There was no water. Echapel Yoshua v'kalev yartu l'kule Eretz Israel. What? Yoshua and Kalev got all the property of everybody in Israel? That's crazy. They would end up with almost everything. So the answer, we're not talking about those mitzlonim. We're talking about the people that went along with Korach. Okay, so that's going to be, right, these 250 people that went with Korach, and it's not the whole nation. And then theoretically, you could say Yeshua and Kalev got a lot of land, okay, but not a crazy, uh, you know, disproportionate amount of land. So that was question four. Okay, now we're going back to question five. Okay, we're back to, why I say back, we're going back to Rav Papa asking questions and saying it seems more likely that it was Yosei Mitzrayim and not Ba'e Haaretz who got, that it was divided among the people who left Egypt and not the people coming into the land. So here's question five. Amar le Rav Papa Labai. Bishlam alaman damar le Yosei Mitzrayim nechalka Haaretz. Hainu dichtiv, and now we're back to Sefer Yoshua chapter 17, but the beginning of the chapter. Okay, in the beginning of the chapter, we have... The, it starts with the B'nai Minashe, and it talks about that, if you remember, the people in Minashe, okay, B'not Slavchad are from Minashe. The people of Minashe lived on both sides of the Jordan. Remember, some of them, half the tribe of Minashe, ended up getting land with Reuven and God. And then half the tribe of Minashe was on the other side in, the, you know, in Israel. So it talks then about the B'nai Minashe HaNotarim, okay, the ones who were left, meaning the ones who went into the land, and they list six families, okay, Abiezer, Chelek, Asriel, Shechem, uh, sorry, Shechem, Kekel, Shmida. okay, so Chefer is one of them. It lists six families. But then there's a passage that doesn't really make so much sense. After it lists the six families, it then says, and then there was Slavchad, who had no daughters, and they basically recount some of the details of the story of Slavchad's daughters who come and they say, we want land. And then it says, um, they got Nachala, and then it says in, in verse 5, by Yiplu Chavlei Menashe Asara, Leva Me'eretz Agla, Vapashanish from Ever Halayagardin. Say there were 10 portions given to Menashe. That's a little bit strange. There should have been six, the six families, right? So why does it say 10? So that's what Rav Papa is going to say to Abai. It says, by Yiplu Chavlei Menashe Asara, Shita de Shita Bateavot. So if you say Leo Tzim Mitzrayim, so fine. You get the six Batavo, the six families that were mentioned in verse two of that chapter, that there were six families who got Nachala. Ve'arba'a did who? And then it's telling you, and four portions were given to the Benot Slavchad. Okay? Ha'asara, and that gets you to 10. Okay, where do we get four portions from? Didn't we say there were three? Right? If you say Leo Tzim Mitzrayim, that was our Mishnah. That's where we started. The Mishnah said they get three. And we'll go through the three right now. They got their father, Tzlovchad. And then they got Pekar's portion that should have gone to Tzlovchad, which is a double portion because Tzlovchad was the Bechor. So they got three. Where the four, we'll get to that soon. The Gemara doesn't explain yet. 
Okay, what we're going to say is, I'll already preface it by telling you, they're going to say there was a brother that Slavchad had who died without heirs, and they got a fourth portion because they got part of his portion as well. Okay, so what really we're saying is there were six portions that went divided among the six families, but there was something unique here about the Menach Slavchad, and therefore it mentioned 10, because it was telling you there were these six families, and even though there's actually a, a, an overlapping here because they were part of Hefer, but it's telling you there were another four portions that Benot Slavcha got, and that only works if you'd say Liyotzei Mitzrayim. But Lamanda Amar Lebaya Aretz, Tim Nayahudahava. But if you say it's to those coming into the land, there should be eight. Why eight? Okay, so again, you have the six of the, of the families, and then you have two of Benot Slavcha. Why two? If you say Baya Aretz, what did we say? They wouldn't get anything because they were they were women, they weren't men. So they wouldn't get anything, but what would happen? their cousins, their first cousins who were male through their father would get portions. It would go back to Hefer, remember? And then what would happen? They would get two of Hefer's portions because Slavchad, there would get Slavchad's part. Slavchad was the Bechor, so he would get two. So when everything went back to the brothers, right, all the brothers of Slavchad and got reshuffled, the whatever portions this generation got, it would be reshuffled and given to Slavchad, which would then go to his daughters. So they would get two portions, so altogether there should be eight. To which the Gemara says, well, according to you, okay, where Abai answers Rav Papa, and he says, according to you, uh, sorry, according to you, I'm sorry, I read the wrong place. But according to you, there should only be nine, because remember, Benot Slavcha got three portions. Two of Hefer's that should have gone to Tzlovchad is the Bechor and Tzlovchad's own portion because he got out of Egypt also was age 20 and over. So it should be nine and not not 10. And I already told you this, even though the Gemara hadn't said this yet. How do you explain the 10? Chad right? That there was one brother of the father that died and they got that portion. So that explains the 10. So if you're going to complain, well, in the other, there's eight instead of 10, and here there were nine instead of 10. How do we resolve the nine to 10? We said there was a brother. Well, in that same token, hachanami, tre you could say there were two brothers of Tzlav who died and he inherited portions of his brothers, right? They had to have died without children. Otherwise their children would have gotten it, but they died without children. So they got those two portions. So you can explain it that way as well. Um, okay. Ditanya. Now, how do we know that they had all these portions? And now we're going to darshan this pasuk in Bamidbar Kaf Zayin, Pasuk Zayin, with the Benot Slavchad. It says there, and I'm going to read you the whole pasuk, came Benot Slavchad of Rov, okay, so Moshe says, you know, or God says to Moshe, I forget, I assume it's God saying to Moshe there, right, they spoke correctly. Naton titen lahem, go give them achuzat nachala betoch achi avihem, vavartan nachalat avihem lahem. It's a bit repetitive, this pasuk. First of all, naton titen is double language, Right, give them a chuzah nachala, a portion of 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 nachala, b'toch achiyavihem with among the brothers of their father, v'ha'avarta nachala tavihem lahem, and you will pass on the nachala of their father to them. There's a lot of extra things in this pesukim. We're going to darshan them all, and here we're going to see the four the fact that they got what we're going to prove here is they must have gotten a portion from a brother. Naton titen lahem. That's already one. That's nachalat avihem. That's the part of their, the portion of their father. Betoch achei avihen, among the brothers of their father, zo nachalat avi avihen. That's what they're getting from Chaper because they're getting it together with the brothers of their father, which means that's Chaper's portion. That's two. Ha'avartan nachalat avihen lehem, and they're going to get the nachalat of their father. They already said the nachalat, give them. Give them was the nachalat of their father. So what are we adding here? Oh, the chelak ha there's the second portion of Hefers that's going to go to them because that's the Bechor that, that Slavcha was the eldest. What about the brother? They even took a portion of a dead brother who had no, no right, dead brother of Slavcha who had no children. The double language of Naton Titain teaches you there was another, there was a brother that they inherited. Ulamanda Amara, the way we just explained, Treyake da Abahabulu, where are you going to get that from if he had two brothers that they inherited? Well, Haume Achuzat Nachala Naka. Okay, why did it say, no, Tontitain Lam Achuzat Nachala? It could have just said Nachala or something like that, or or Natontitain Lam. Obviously, we're talking about Nachala. Why did it add those words? That's the fourth brother. Okay, and with that, we explained how you could get to the fact that there were 
that they inherited four different portions, all learned out from that pasuk. So the fifth question of Rapapa, again, trying to say it seems they're the same as Rhyme, not only Haaretz, again, we explain by saying perhaps they had two other portions that were given to them because it was brothers of Slavchad who didn't make it. And that was because even in the first explanation, you had to explain it was a brother. Once you have one brother, well, you could say there were two brothers. Okay, last question. Amalei Rav Papa Labai. Kra my kachashiv. So what is the is, um, the pasuk? Right, one second. Um, kra, right. When it says, Chavalei menashe, what are they counting here? Eat falim kachashiv, tu vahavu. Ibate avot kachashiv, shitahavu. Now we have a problem with this pasuk, and we'll leave this as a, as a question right now, and we'll end with this. Um, when the pasuk says there were 10 sections, right, if it's saying the children and they took their father's portions, there's way more than 10, because there were a lot more children, right? It wouldn't be making any sense. And if you're talking about families, there's only six, right? If You, you might have noticed this. We mentioned Hefer was in the first six, but then we said Benot Slavchad, who got their Hefer's portion are mentioned in the extra four. So something doesn't really make sense about this pasuk and mixing the six and the four. Because again, if we're talking about all the children who got this way more than 10, and if we're talking about the families, there's really only six. So we're going to leave this as a question and resolve this in tomorrow's class. So what did we do today? We basically had six questions of Rav Papa. Four of them were really against this opinion of Ba'er Aretz. Okay, both. Okay, let's just go through quickly. We had were Benoslav complaining about? They shouldn't have gotten anything. And then we explained, no, 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 they did. Because if it goes back to Hefer, right? If Even if it goes to the people coming in the land now, it still goes back to Hefer and gets redivided according to brothers. And then they should have gotten Slavkat's portion. So we had a resolution to that. The second was the B'nai Yosef. What were they complaining about? They should have, if they were a lot of people, they would have gotten. And then we said, oh, we mean their kids. And then we said the, the third was... Um, um, uh, right, then we, sorry, that was question three, because I read question one we dealt with yesterday's class. Then we had a tangent of a Abai who got into this whole thing about from the fact that we have two complaints, it must be no one else didn't get land because otherwise they would have complained. And then we said, no, they just wouldn't have mentioned it. And the whole point of mentioning Yosef, even though they didn't get answered, right, we wouldn't have mentioned it because they didn't get answered. All the Benot Slavcha were important to say because they got an answer. And the answer was, yes, you're right, your complaint was legitimate. The other ones would have complained without a legitimate complaint. What would be the point of mentioning it? Yosef, they didn't get what they wanted. Oh, but their mention teach you the whole thing about Ayin Hara. You should avoid Ayin Hara. From there, we got to the question, fourth question, which was about the Meraglim and, and the ones who say the Mitlonim and the Korach were just like the Meraglim and Yeshua and Kaleb got their land. That doesn't make any sense because how could they have gotten everybody's land? Which we said, oh, it's not the Mitlonim in general in the desert. That would be most of the Jewish people. No, it was really just the Mitlona name of Korach. And then, which already explained something we knew, but we knew it based on this, basically. The order is, right, the Gemara is not linear. So we kind of earlier explained it based on what the Gemara concludes here. That was the fourth question. Fifth question goes back to the issue of, it seems like, because of Lehman Asher Asara and the four parts of the Menot Slavcha, which we explained. But then we said, ah, we can explain it also according to Be'er Aretz. We got an extra two there because of the brothers. There must have been brothers that died without children, and the Bnei Slavchad each got portions of their stuff. And then the last question was, why has this puzzle make sense at all? This six and ten, it should be oh, either six or way more than six. So what's this puzzle talking about? And we'll deal with that tomorrow. And as why is the puzzle kind of, if you really want to ask it like this, why is the puzzle mix one generation and the second generation? It seems families like. The, the earlier families, the six sons of Menashe. But then it starts talking about the granddaughters who inherited, as if we're talking about all the, all the children who were coming into the land. Well, then it should have mentioned all the children, which is way more than 10. So we have to figure out what, what the Pesach was trying to do there. And we'll deal with that first thing tomorrow's class. Wishing everyone a good day and a peaceful day. And Ma'adim Simcha.